All right, so I just have some notes. Uh, I began looking at uh, RethinkDB um, mostly for personal projects, and then um, from an operational perspective, um, I work at Flipboard. Uh, we're entirely in AWS. Um, so I began looking into it for some smaller, uh, sort of little projects at Flipboard. So I'm just going to go over my experience going through the documentation from an operator's perspective as opposed to a developer's perspective. Um, the docs seem to be very, very developer focused, which is awesome, particularly for application developers that just install it on their laptop. They want to get up and running. That's great. Um, but then it's like, okay, well, let's light up a new database in production. And then the operators are all like, oh, I don't know. So this is mostly about um, my reading of the documentation. So as far as getting started, um, it being in Homebrew and just running is awesome. Um, we run a lot of HBase at Flipboard um, and, some MyC and a bunch of MySQL also. And HBase is kind of a bear to get running. Uh, so just having it run uh, on uh, OS X is awesome. Having packages for popular Linux distributions is also great. Um, we, I use Ubuntu personally, and we also run um, entirely on Ubuntu uh, at work, so that's great. Um, serving the GPG key over HTTP, not so awesome. So this is something that I, I see a lot of people do it, like Nginx does it. Um, if that was over HTTPS, that would be awesome. Um, so yeah, apt-get-y install RethinkDB was my getting started on Ubuntu. Uh, it did not start by default, which is great. I like it when I install a package and it doesn't start running, especially a database. Um, read the, uh, the output, and of course, um, it's not running because there's no config file in Etsy RethinkDB instances.d. So um, I took a look at the default configuration that came with it. Um, it's all comments, which is really, really cool, because that means that I don't need to learn the configuration just to get it up and running, which is a really, really great um, sort of beginning point. Also, it's really short. Uh, the default configuration is like, sure. It's, uh, yeah, the rethink documentation, or excuse me, the configuration file is 100 lines including comments, which is really, really short. So this is Cassandra's, which is 850 lines. This is Redis, which is not really a database. And it's 900 lines. Again, mostly comments, um, so it's a little unfair. But still, not having to like spend an afternoon reading through the configuration file just to get the database up and running is a huge, huge win. Um, I and I style. Um, that's the format of the configuration file. One thing I did wonder uh, is, does the last value win? So instead of having to write a sed script or something to you know, sort of replace values, um, it'd be cool if you could uh, just append to the file. Um, most INI style readers usually just read the last value. So I assume that that works, but that was a question that I had. So I copied the configuration sample um, and then started it. And then it also, during startup, mentioned where it was listening and that you need to configure um, configure it specially in order to listen on all network interfaces, which is cool. Um, so then I wondered, if it's already running and I install the upgrade, will it restart the database? So what I did was I attempted to install and ended up installing the previous version, uh, 2.0.1. And then just, just to see, you know, at that point it's running, let's, run, let's upgrade to 2.0.2, see what it does. Um, it, after some false starts, uh, it does, in fact, restart, which is not a huge deal. It's something that we don't particularly like, uh, mostly because we typically will inst like we'll just spray packages around the file system everywhere on our cluster, and then we like to do the upgrade sort of manually. Um, so, if that you know, if it didn't uh, restart by default, I think that would be grand. Um, let's see, the another por portion of the getting started documentation: the compilation steps for building from source. Uh, say to run config, dot slash configure dash dash allow fetch, uh, which scares me because uh, a lot of shops, uh, not Flipboard, but a lot of shops do uh, not allow machines with compilers to access the internet and vice versa. Machines that, ac that can access the internet don't have compilers. Um, so if I wanted to run this on a machine that didn't have external um, internet access, what would I need to stage in place beforehand in order for me to be able to run dot slash configure without the allow fetch option. So that's one thing that uh, I think would be great to add to the documentation. Um, the writing rethink DB drivers page is really, really, really good. Um, I happened to look at the Kafka protocol documentation just earlier this week. We run a lot of Kafka at Flipboard. Um, and it's really, really long and it, it's, it's, it's just cumbersome um, writing a new uh, Kafka client in another language. Um, whereas the writing the RethinkDB drivers documentation page is awesome. Um, some questions that I had while reading through the operation 
operationally focused documentation. The memory usage page talks about um, each query and background process using between one and 20 megabytes of memory. Um, I, I'm assuming that that's just hard to estimate ahead of time, so that's why that range is so big. But also, what about connections? So we talked about, um, or excuse me, Mike talked about uh, connections being as cheap, or having a bunch of consumers being as cheap as a connection. So what is the overhead on the server of that? So a perfect example, we have um, at work, we have a, an RDS instance running MySQL that has like almost 2,000 open TCP connections. Um, just because we have each application server with a pool of three or four connections, and then we have hundreds of application servers. So what happens to, and MySQL of course has a bunch of overhead per connection in RAM on the MySQL side. So what is the over, so yes, connections are very cheap, generally speaking, but what is the overhead there? I think that would be a great answer to find in the documentation. Hot backup. Uh, the documentation states that it will use some cluster resources, but it will not lock out any of the clients. So you can safely run it on a live cluster, which also scares me. Um, a little more detail would be great here. Uh, so the newest version of HBase, uh, which was released, I want to say early this month, um, added request throttling, which is very, very useful. You can throttle um, requests by either user or the table in HBase, and you can, do it based on, um, you can do it by bandwidth, which is really, really cool. So you can say like, only throttle, you know, throttle these requests to a megasecond or, a, I don't know, 100k a second or something. So if you have sort of secondary or analytical queries that are running on your real-time cluster, you can slow those down so that you don't impact your sort of user-facing queries. Uh, the deploying rethink DB section of the docs is pretty sparse. Um, the monitoring section, um, so the system tables, um, these are rethink DB tables. Uh, so that, I think, makes the um, burden of writing uh, monitoring scripts that talk to your existing uh, monitoring systems um, just harder. Because uh, then all of a sudden you have to pull in a RethinkDB client in order to pull all the information about the system. Um, so I think reporters would be fantastic. Um, so things like uh, J exposing the system information as JSON over HTTP is sort of what a lot of systems today are moving toward. Uh, so I think that would be a great first step if it wasn't necessarily just actually feeding the metrics out into these other systems like OpenTSDB or Graphite. Um, just exposing it so that, um, you know, it, an ops person who's used to writing this typically will can write a little script that just, you know, pulls every, I don't know, minute or 20 seconds or whatever. Um, a perfect example of which metrics uh, to pay attention to is um, in the React documentation. Um, so React is, I don't know if those are aware, it's a distributed key value database written by these folks at uh, Basho. Um, they have a section of their documentation that talks about specific metrics that you want to pay attention to. So typically when you look at these JSON over HTTP endpoints, it's like this barrage of, uh, of, these, of these metrics. And as an operator, you don't really know which ones you really need to pay attention to. So sort of like if you were to have a rethink DB dashboard, what are the three or four or six numbers that you really want to pay attention to? Um, and maybe alarm on them, um, things like that. Um, another one is there's a lot of throughput um, statistics reported. Latency numbers would also be great. So not just uh, re uh, read and write operations per second, but the latency. So React, for example, has the exposed median 95th, 99th percentile and the maximum uh, latency for reads and writes. Uh, so that would be fantastic because throughput is important, um, but seeing latency would also be cool. Um, of course, you can instrument this on the client, too, and we typically do. That obviously very, is very common. But being able to see it from the database side is just another um, lens on the problem. A uh, question I had about deletes that someone asked about. I just threw this in here. Or, excuse me. Someone mentioned uh, deleting documents. I think Mike, during his demo, deleted a document. So my question is, are they soft deletes or are they hard deletes? I'm guessing because it's a log structure, they're soft and they get cleaned up later. But things like oh, I'm going to delete, you know, I have 1,000 documents, I'm going to delete 900 right now. Why isn't my, free sp why isn't my space freed up? You know, questions like this are, are very, very typical when evaluating a database. We have an application right now that does a lot of deletes, and we often see things like, you know, we typically do our compactions for HBase nightly, so we don't see the, the, the space freed up until then. Um, version migration. So there's a page on this, which is awesome. Uh, one question I have is, it's, uh, just from the reading, it seems single node focused. Um, some information about whether or not it can be done in a rolling fashion would be great. So you have a 10-node cluster, they're running 2.0.2, 2.0.3 comes out. Uh, how do I, do I take everybody down, install the package on everyone, and then start them all up? Can I do them one by one? Um, information about that would be great. Systemd support is not a huge one. Um, it appears to be in progress. Uh, the next 
long-term support release of Ubuntu, they're, my understanding is that they're planning to use systemd as their default init system. So having an answer in 11 months uh, would be great. Um, logging. Um, this is a big one, because uh, I can't stand when I log into a database and I don't frequently read the logs, and I then tail the logs to see, like, you know, some application is complaining about the database. And I go and tail the logs, and I'm like, well, I don't know what's normal. I don't know uh, what the, for maybe the format's funky or something like that. So some documentation about what the log syntax is. React, in particular, has very, very good doc documentation about this. Um, and then rotation, is it built in, is it not? It's not a big deal if it is. Most ops people know how to use log rotate, so that's not a huge deal. Um, and then log levels. Um, is it just, you know, basically, info and up everywhere, is there debug logging or maybe trace logging that can um, log every single request and the operations that are happening on the cluster. Um, information about that would be great. Whether or not it's configurable, not a huge deal. Um, and then of course runtime configuration would be fantastic. If you could just, with an admin command, just say bump up the logging right now because I'm really curious about what's going on at this very moment. Uh, clustering, I haven't played with it at all because I, just from reading what's going on and looking at GitHub, uh, looks like the Raft-based stuff uh, is going to land in 2.1 soonish. I, I can find a timeline, not that it's a big deal. But I basically, I'm not going to put that through the paces until that stuff lands because it won't really be interesting. Not having automatic failover and then testing automatic failover is kind of pointless. Um, open questions that I didn't see, other open, random open questions that I didn't see answered in the documentation. Uh, is there a preferred file system? Uh, so ext4, xfs, cfs, when we were First, doing our Graphite install, we did a lot of benchmarking on it, particularly ext4 uh, versus XFS. So some recommendation there, if they're, you know, if they're both okay, then you know, at least something saying that so that it, um, folks don't have to do the benchmarking. Um, the, of course, the, one of the issues with Mongo uh, that everyone knows about is that when the data size gets larger than memory, bad stuff happens. So uh, the documentation, of course, states that uh, RethinkDB performs well, if that's the um, when that's the case, but things like does latent th do, do the latency and throughput profiles change drastically when that happens? If not, great. Um, if so, you know what, did, what does the hit look like? Um, also, official benchmarks. So this came up. I think I, I feel like I read a thread on Hacker News recently about the science or lack thereof of benchmarking. Um, official benchmarks, I think, would be fantastic. So if I know folks have always have strong opinions about how benchmarks should be done. Uh, but some like official like, you know, here's our test hardware, here's what it looks like, here's all the stuff, uh, particularly AWS instances. Um, so Flipboard is entirely in AWS. My side projects use other cloud servers, uh, DigitalOcean or AWS. Um, so something about what kind of instance sizing you should perform would be great, I think. Um, the, uh, also spreading over multiple volumes, of course in, obviously in real hardware you have this too, but in AWS folks will often have uh, s several EBS volumes attached to an instance. Uh, so it doesn't look like there's built-in support for sort of the JBOD style, just round robin maybe your, your writes or your reads uh, across the disks. But something about um, either whether or not that's coming or if you should just stripe and call it a day. Um, backup restore. So with HBase, we have a lot of trouble with DNS. Um, it looks like all the documentation points to um, using IP addresses for configuration between nodes. Um, but if there's any DNS configuration that's necessary, I think, you know, it'd be good to say, you know, if you restore a node that has a, with, off the same data set that has a different fully qualified domain name, is there going to be trouble? Does it not matter? It'd be great if it doesn't matter, and it seems like it. Um, so that's another question. And then what happens when disks flake out? So either when they die, when they fill up. Um, if they fill up, can you still perform reads, but maybe writes block? Um, some, some answers to those sorts of questions uh, I think would be, would be great to add to, oper to the operations documentation. So again, this is mostly just like the things that I think about when I'm reading the documentation from an operations perspective, because obviously the developer experience is very well documented and it seems to be fantastic, but then it's like, okay, now let's get this up and running. Oh wait, I have no idea what's gonna happen when you know, the data size grows larger than memory or if the disks fill up or if it's AWS, right? So when nodes die every day, frankly. So, um, that's it.